In this topic module, by the way, I'm Vi Grinia. I'm the chief scientist at Parallax Advanced Research. So today in this topic module, we're going to be talking about uh, materials and structures that manipulate the functional properties of optical uh, wavelengths all the way through thermal. Uh, and uh, doctors Jennifer Lolly from Nanasonic, Alan Gorodetsky from uh, UC Irvine, and uh, Matthew Shockey from Ghent University will uh, be talking about their work in thermally protective materials, in adaptive infrared uh, and thermal regulation inspired by cephalopods, and uh, melanin self-assembly for uh, materials inspired by birds, and the variety of applications that come out of that. So our first speaker, Dr. Jen Lolly from Nanasonic, uh, we'll be talking about structures that are inspired by silkworm cocoons. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Jen Lolly. I am a polymer chemist. Um, I am also at Nanasonic with Dr. Maggie Bum. I have been at Nanasonic now for more than 20 years. Uh, we are a small advanced materials company. We are located in Pembroke, Virginia. Uh, for those of you who don't know where that big city is, we're about 15 miles uh, down the road from Virginia Tech. If you are ever in the area, we would love for you to come and visit. Um, one of the things I want to start with is that, again, I am, I am not a, a biomimic, um, but what I would like to do is share with you my journey over my 20 years of research um, at Nanosonic and how I have come to work with a number of new materials through bioinspiration and biomimicry. And um, part of the reason for that is because of this gorgeous area that we live in. Um, and actually, if you visit us, we'll probably take you to uh, the mountain where they filmed Dirty Dancing. Um, so it's a really beautiful spot to go. Um, anyway, so one of the things that um, we were asked, uh, so again, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, Trish invited us and we were asked to think about wins and losses and gains and pains and products. Um, you don't learn by being perfect, so I have learned a lot over the years. Um, where do I take my inspiration um, from, from bio? Um, I sit in uh, tree stands often. Um, I used to do it a lot more before I had children. Uh, but when I get the chance to sit in a tree stand, I look around, it's quiet. I think of all the different things around me that, um, that nature could do that I can't. So for example, um, a research program that we had many years ago out of SOCOM was to find a way to protect divers that would be going into very cold water um, to protect them from hyperthermia, but also hypothermia. Uh, that's the part that you don't think of. So you've got this guy or woman in water and um, they need to stay warm, but after they're doing their, um, their mission, they get overheated. Uh, so sitting in my uh, tree stand, you know, I hiked up a mountain and I was sweating. I was dying by the end of it. And you hear people say like, oh, I'm so hot and dying. Um, there are some situations where, you know, that is a threat. If you are overheated, you now have a thermal target on your back. You have a thermal signature. So what I'm gonna talk about today is flame resistance, thermal signature, thermal insulation. And I wanna talk about the different materials that Nanosonic has available to us and how we kind of go about designing a new product and um, you know the different ways that we could potentially team with the um, biomimics here. So what we had done is, um, you saw that really great talk this morning from the soon-to-be Dr. Cat. Uh, she was showing the mushroom, uh, so you can compress the air out of a mushroom. So if you think about thermal comfort, and you get under that down blanket tonight, you know you're you're warm. You've got all that air there. Uh, when you compress that air out, and you go to the comfort level of a t-shirt. Now you're cool. So how do you integrate that into a protective ensemble? Uh, the way that we thought about it was, what if we could take a shape memory um, porous foam so that you can change the size of the pores? So now you've gone from something where you're hiking up that mountain, you've got those big, beautiful air pores, and then you get there and then you have this thermal response that your body knows like, oh, okay, so hot, let's cool down and compress that air out. So we talk about wins and losses. Um, that was a challenging program. Uh, we were able to make that material work, but what had happened was we, we put this material in a garment, in a jacket that I actually wore on an expedition. 
And so we designed that material to work for divers in the water. And the, the temperature range was cold. But the expedition I went on was in Canada. I got off the airplane and I, I looked at my husband. I said, I can't move. He said, what do you mean you can't move? I said, my jacket's frozen. I can't move. So we designed the TG higher than uh, where it was performing. So yeah, I froze. I wore it for a photo op. It was great. But anyway, um, that didn't work. So that's a loss, but we learned from it. So where do we go from here? Um, what I'm going to talk about today, again, is how we use some of these flame-resistant materials um, in different projects, how they work. Um, how do they affect human beings? And when materials are burned, how, uh, how safe are we when materials are burned? What kind of materials should we be using in flame-resistant um, products? And then finally, where, where else can we use these different insulation materials? How can they give us better performance in space? Um, how can we tie all these different things together? So what I would like to talk about today are different hierarchical structures um, where the fail was in getting that repeated uh, shape memory behavior of that porous foam. I'm gonna take a step back and do something that's a little bit simpler and get some thermal insulation from a hierarchical structure um, inspired by the silkworm um, who makes these beautiful cocoons. What I love about this structure is that if you think about a cryotank or a tank that has different layers to it, you have this all important inner liner. You've got the insulation that's your structural wrap. That's also, again, it's, it contains air, that's your insulation. But then they also, of course, have their chemistry and their hydrophobicity that protects these uh, cocoons from the weather. So. When we go about making something, we, we like to look to nature and see, okay, how can we uh, include this um, hydrogen impermeable or low permeation um, core? And then how can we overwrap that? And then what other materials can we use to achieve all these different um, problems that we're facing? So um, one of the things that, uh, that got me into trouble years ago in terms of biomimicry um, was the, uh, the thought of this shape memory material. So you saw yesterday on the tour the, um, the nickel materials, the shape memory metals. So we made a material many years ago uh, when we were doing molecular level self-assembly. We were making electrically conductive stretchy materials called metal rubber. Uh, they're great materials because instead of evaporating a metal onto a polymer film and then stretching it, when you do that, you have this discontinuous break in the electron hopping, and now you've got a discontinuous continuity uh, for the conductivity, and you've got loss of conductivity, loss of shielding, loss of properties. So if you can do this molecular level self-assembly and put this onto this nice uh, rubber material, you can stretch it repeatedly and maintain conductivity. So great shielding for electronics, flexible applications. And then we were building in um, materials where you could apply voltage. And so we were doing shape memory metal rubber and mimicking um, morphing aircraft wings. So this is kind of where this, this thought of the shape memory porous foams came from. So now, uh, where we are today, again, as Maggie showed, we're in this beautiful, uh, the Wheatland Eco Park, 30,000 square foot LEED certified facility, uh, much better than the, this was a bar. Uh, we literally ripped out the, <laughs> the bar <laughs> and uh, put in a chemistry lab, um, but now we've got this, this beautiful facility. So we now have our, at our disposal today, not just the scaling of polymers and scaling of materials, we've got a lot of different additive manufacturing capabilities um, at hand. So Nanosonic has nothing to do with sound. Uh, we had a, uh, an electrical engineer who at, the, uh, at founding the company knew that Nano was kind of the bubble at the time. Um, and then we had a chemist who said, well, I like Panasonic, can we be Nanosonic? And they did. Uh, so that's us, nothing to do again with sound. But what we do, our real business model has been to scale nanostructured materials into macro scale products that are useful to, to someone. Um, so that's what we do. Um, what we have also been fortunate enough to do through um, a lot of funding and collaboration with partners is now look at moving beyond just the materials but using additive manufacturing techniques to make these large structures, so to prove out those polymers. 
So one of the beautiful things about polymers and the ability to make multifunctional materials is that you can now make materials that have properties that are typically mutually exclusive. So if we think about flame resistance, um, or let's start with actually um, energy absorption. If you wanna put something in a vehicle for head impact protection um, that would again protect the soldiers or protect someone there, um, typically flame resistant materials are, they're not flexible. And if they are, they burn. Uh, so that was our challenge in, in one of the areas. Another one is for the insulation. Instead of trying to make the material breathe, let's try to make something that's flexible, but where we have a standoff compression, we have structural insulation built into the material. So we, we looked at patterning, and that's what we did there. The third thing is, again, how do you make a hydrogen-containing uh, vessel, either a hydrogen hose or a pressure vessel, um, that's flexible, but yet um, still uh, would maintain the high pressures of, uh, of hydrogen. So where, where we are now, um, again, we, we started with this concept of the blast and flame resistant polymer because there was an incident many years ago on the USS Cole. If you remember this, there was a fire. Um, people couldn't get off. They didn't have enough time. So what we were looking for is how do we make a new material, a new composite, that would give people time to escape um, a danger like this. So we actually, um, instead of just doing a small scale test, uh, we coded half of a home. Uh, we had the news, we had, we had everyone out to see this. They were supposed to demo the home and we said, you know what, let us coat half of it. And the firefighters came out, they did their demos, they did their training on this. And so they burned the house down um, my parents came out to see it and they were angry because it just wouldn't burn. So no one could leave and get dinner because it just, it stood there. Uh, the next day, what you see is this char. So we've got that, you know, we know um, organics burn, um, inorganics don't. So it's really finding that combination of materials. So we then did a test uh, to show that it actually is, um, you know, we did a real test. We did the, uh, the ISO 9705, um, tests and showed that it is a fire restrictive material. The um, other thing that's important is, you know, one of the concerns in the town was even, well, you're burning this. What, you know, what are you doing? What are you putting off into the, the atmosphere? What's great about these siloxane based composite materials is that the only thing we were putting off was carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, which it's not great, but it's not the, um, the toxic mix that you're burning off from your urethane foams. So that was something that we were looking at there. The reason that that's kind of near and dear to me is um, a friend of mine was actually involved in an IED. Um, and he is not suffering now lifelong issues with head impact, but he has problems with pneumonia because of what he breathed in in the fire. So it's important to think about what you're going to be burning and, and doing. So... What's again cool about chemistry is that you can, you can design things. Um, we can design that level of char that's left based on the number and type of inorganic units that you're putting in your polymer. Um, so again, really cool being able to design materials. Um, this is an example of that, that burning test. Uh, what will happen here if a video played is that whoop, you'd go through uh, burn a hole right through the, the seats that currently pass flame resistance testing because they don't drip, except for it burns through. Um, but with our materials, um, it just chars, which is great. So now thinking about insulation and, um, and again, going back to the silkworm cocoon, uh, we are looking at additive manufacturing to make these structural composites. So we're taking these materials lessons that we've learned over the years and integrating them through filament winding um, so that we can make large structures. What we can also do is incorporate insulation. Uh, we saw the aerogel earlier in these structures to also give us um, elastic collisions um, to help stop neutrons. So if we're looking at radiation shielding, this is a great way of putting in um, other materials to protect us in space. So right now where we're at is we are looking to get away specifically just from carbon fiber. Uh, we've looked at hemp, we've looked at flax, we've looked at spectra, so we've looked at all different types of materials that we can filament wind with. And um, 
again, this is really where we're at. We're looking at hydrogen storage, um, hierarchical structures. And um, one of the things that I'll also mention here is again, we, we know that we're kind of the problem. Um, I took my seven-year-old to the Taylor Swift movie last weekend, and I don't really know her music, but she sings a song that says, hi, I'm me, I'm the problem. And that's the polymers. So we know we need to go in, we need to do something about this. Um, so one of the programs Nanasonic has is to reclaim carbon fiber um, from their composites. So we can break that down with a facile uh, solution and get those back. Um, so lastly, I just want to touch on the spirit of SPIR programs. Um, dual use commercialization is always critical. We're looking for areas that we can develop a product and then develop a wider um, broad, spread mar broad spread market. So those um, suits that we are putting into the, the dive suits right now with this standoff um, insulation protection, we are also developing this thermal array material that we have sold in Shelby gloves, um, firefighter flexible gloves. We're also developing it for um, the flame resistance and insulation within the jet engines of uh, JSF, so looking at nacelle blankets. And with that, um, I'm gonna end there and just let you know again that we are Nanasonic in Pembroke, Virginia, and we would love to partner uh, with you great biomimics here. Thanks.